into the office in the start of middle of February, I'd been inundated. There was lots of uh, requests for, for speeches and keynotes and launches and, and talks. And they're all great to get, but I had two from the very early on invitations that I were, was particularly looking forward to and scared, scared stiff about. One was to my old secondary school back in Billy Town. <laughs> we had a few prizes. First time the, the headmaster allowed me in there without, <laughs> without any problems. <laughs> And the second one was here, because it, it's a bit like a home gig. Um, it's, it's sort of speaking to people who know me, which is always a little bit more difficult. I don't mind what other people think, but I might be interested in what you guys are thinking. Um, so listen, well, let me get on with it. Uh, I know we're a wee bit behind schedule already. PSI classics. Um, so, with it, no further ado, I'll, keep, I'll get going. I suppose, what I want to say, last year, Paul Dalton, who made a, a fantastic start, and start to his, his uh, presidential uh, address, and he, when he took over as president, he spoke about being excited to lead the PSI, and he said that the, he wanted to leverage the knowledge of psychology and education, practice and science, to create a society where the most vulnerable are loved, where difference is celebrated, and where the enormous capacity of the human project for creating a compassionate, economically vibrant, inclusive and socially connected society is realised. How do I compete with that? I mean, that's, that's fantastic, and that's a great, great goal. He went on to say then that this is how the PSI will flourish in the future. It will flourish because psychologists want to be part of a professional body that shapes policy, that speaks emphatically, compassionately and tenderly, and that takes its place confidently at the table of the grown-ups. And I suppose I, I hope that's part of what's happening. We're, we're starting to do that. We're starting to be more passionate and more outspoken in, in the ways we, we work with the general society, the wider society. From my point of view, Ireland today is starting to rebuild itself from all the hurt and pain and economic devastation that was wrought on it over the past decade. The impact of, on children has been enormous and the impact on the poorest and most disadvantaged children has been disproportionate to all others. We just need to look at the levels of child poverty and the large numbers of children who have been made homeless with their families to know that our society has a lot of repairing to do. As a psychologist it's difficult to stand over such effects but as ombudsman it's impossible and as both there's an opportunity for me and my office to make a systemic difference. We need to make sure that the lost are found and the forgotten are remembered in a way that properly respects their position as children and individual rights holders. The aim of this talk today is to outline the role of the Ombudsman for Children in promoting and protecting the rights of all children and also give an insight into how my experience as a psychologist influences the way that that role will be fulfilled. I'm just going to go quickly through these because I think a lot of people will know some of the background but not everybody. I'll do it quickly but I'll just make sure that I get don't miss too many points. After, in, uh, after working for two and a half years as Director of Investigations, I was appointed in uh, February this year by the President to become Ombudsman for Children. I'm working to a legislation in 2002, Ombudsman for Children Act, which states we were an independent statutory body directly accountable to their activists. What that actually means is that I don't account to a minister or to a department. I have the opportunity and the obligation to challenge the departments, to challenge the ministers, to challenge the government when I see flaws in the, in the system in relation to how children have been dealt with. Since the Ombudsman's office was established, it's dealt with over 11,000 complaints relating to actions of public bodies. The majority of complaints are brought to us by parents who are frequently obliged to become advocates, campaigners, and even, as one mother told us recently, unofficial caseworkers on behalf of their children. Everything she says was such a battle. It was our only option. But the thing is, parents shouldn't have to become campaigners and case managers for their child. You shouldn't get care for your child based on your resources, or your powers of persuasion, or your location, or your ability to lobby. For me, that's the best example of an argument for equal rights for all children that's, that can be put out there. I think it's crucial that we, we recognise that. My mandate also allows me to, apart from the complaint handling and investigations which many people will know about, we also have a mandate and an obligation to monitor and advise on legislation and public policy. So if a minister wants to child-proof a legislation, they'll send it to us. And if they don't send it to us, we can still send our advice to them. And from my point of view, that's a crucial way for us to try and prevent errors going into the system early on. So we were constantly monitoring what legislation is coming out. We also try to 
promote the awareness of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, and we consult the children and highlight their concerns, and we undertake commission research. Just as before we get into the real meat of this, I suppose this is a, a slide that I found, and I think it sort of encapsulates what we're trying to do in the office, is trying to find the difference between wrong and right, walk the, the line between fair and balance and advocacy. And it's a difficult one because our legislation says that I'm neither an advocate for a child nor the adversary to a public body. And that's a typical, difficult one to walk, but I think it, it, it will tie in with a lot of what we do as psychologists. Often we're working in the grey. We wish everything was right, right is right, but it's always, not always as clear how you find that right. And I think it's just, it's just a, a little piece that I found that I thought may be interesting to some of you as well. But the concept that when you're doing it wrong, or you're, doing it, you're the only one doing it, doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. I think that's oftentimes what happens. The flaws get built into a system, then everybody says, well, that's what we're always doing, that's what we're doing, and we did it for the last 10 years, why are you changing it now? And the reality is there's a flaw, and somebody needs to point it out. And that's part of what we do. I suppose, as Ombudsman for Children, I've often returned to the question posed by Eleanor Roosevelt in 1958. She asked, where do human rights begin? And then she answered it by saying, in small places, close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any map in the world. <coughs> Yet they are the world of the individual person, the neighbourhood he lives in, the school or college he attends, the factory, farm or office where he works. Unless these rights have meaning there, <coughs> they have little meaning anywhere. And again, if you substitute him for child, it really is where we're working at. Human rights and children's rights are basically where the child goes to school, where he's housed, where he's cared for, where he plays, where he finds security and, and safety. We need to know that the government and any public service that are dealing with children in those situations are providing their rights in the best way possible and, and advocating for them where they need to. In those small places, the places where children are and where they're likely to experience harm, distress and abuse, we need to know that for that to happen, all of us have to contribute. In this talk, I'd like to explain a bit about how the work that I do contributes to that practice of rights in the small places. And I'd also like to talk, talk to you about how you can be part of that as well. How we can all contribute to the creation of a rights-based public administration system where the rights and best interests of children are the primary consideration. The columnist Fintan O'Toole remarked, the establishment of the Office for Children, Ombudsman for Children's Office, embodied for the first time an official recognition of children as citizens. And it's this concept of children as citizens, as people in their own right, which has underpinned my office since it was established. The first holder of the office, Emily Logan, explained this early on in her tenure when she said, children are holders of rights, they're not the possessions of parents or of the state. For too long, as we know, that has not been the view taken by many in authority. Indeed, it was only yesterday that legislation was finally placed before the Oireachtas, banning the defence of reasonable chastisement by parents of their children, long after many other countries have done so, and this change at long last places Ireland on an equal footing with the vast majority of European member states. That view of children as effectively the possessions of others has led to the horrific abuse which, we've all, which has been well publicised and has scandalised and shocked people over the last number of years. Acknowledging that children are individuals with entitlements to rights and protection is one of the very important ways to prevent that sort of abuse ever happening again. Having through my career witnessed the impact of those attitudes and that abuse, I believe strongly in the protection and promotion of children's rights and in bringing them home so that they have an effect in those small places. Whilst, as I will explain, a statutory and policy framework which promotes and upholds children's rights is vital, it will never be effective unless each professional who comes into contact with the child understands that framework and their role in promoting the rights of the child. Whilst many people are aware of the work of the office to the complaints we deal with, my overall mandate is to promote and monitor the rights and welfare of children up to the age of 18 living in Ireland. And as part of that job, we also try to ensure that Ireland complies in full with its international rights, human rights obligations. For example, we are statutorily mandated, mandated to promote the principles and provisions of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. The Convention is a cornerstone of much that we do, but it's not the only relevant treaty Ireland has signed. Our commitments mean that we are obliged under international law to put those obligations into effect in our own law and practice. It also means we are scrutinised as to our performance in this respect. And generally this means that every five years the state is required to submit a report on its performance on the various UN human rights treaties and then be questioned about that performance by bodies such as the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. 
Ireland has a very good uh, reputation abroad and we are often reminded that as a small country we punch well above our weight in terms of our influence and presence in places like the UN. And we love that, we revel in that. But increasingly we are coming under the international spotlight for just how well or not we are measuring up to those obligations. In January 2016, Ireland comes under that spotlight again. The UN Committee on the Rights of the Child will consider Ireland's consolidated third and fourth report, which is basically one's ten years of, of reporting, and there will be oral hearings on that. Our Minister for Children, Youth Affairs and Civil Servants will have to answer questions about the state, or how the state has done, and my office will be there to contribute to that process. I've already generated and submitted the shadow report to the committee and met with them in June this year to highlight the areas I believe the state has done well in and where improvements are still needed. I made 63 different recommendations around areas such as education, disability, violence against children and children's rights. Some of the more specific recommendations related to the issues of homelessness, mental health and child poverty. Indeed, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child has already identified that access to mental health services will be a matter it wishes to hear more about when it speaks with areas government in January. One of the points my office will be making at that session in January is that there are areas of good practice, but progress to date has been too uneven across the public sector. The UNCRC has not been fully incorporated into law, rather certain principles of the Convention have been partially incorporated into primary legislation in a number of areas, but there are others, such as education and health, where it has not. So for example, the Convention on the Rights of the Child requires that in all actions concerning children, whether undertaken by public or private social welfare institutions, courts of law, administrative authorities or legislative bodies, the best interest of the child shall be a primary consideration. Unfortunately, it has been a consistent theme emerging from our investigations that public bodies do not routinely have due regard to this obligation when carrying out their functions with respect to children. And that's despite the passing of the 31st Amendment. And one of the best examples I can give you that is, is a case that we investigated maybe two or three years ago now, where a young girl, teenage girl, um, applied for uh, admission to a school in third year. She got the admission, was, was agreed, and then subsequently, subsequently withdrawn withdrawn when the principal found out that she was pregnant. She went to another school and applied again subsequently for fourth year because she wanted to be with her family and friends who were in that school and again it was, it was denied. So we have a simple situation here where the rules of law and the best interest of that child which was clear there should be no discrimination in the admission to school in that regard was not being upheld because the principal was the, sole, was the owner of the school and was also the manager of the school. It was a very very clear case in which the best interest of the ch child is very much ignored. The, the recommendation we made was that the Department of Education had to inspect this and, and make sure that all the governance was in place. They were done within a day and uh, they made huge changes in that, in that regard. The report that we sent to the UNCRC was a very detailed one and anyone who wants to see the full details of it, um, it'll be up on our website. What I want to do is maybe just draw your attention to a number of examples of what we said in the report. And I'll, I'll run through this relatively quickly because I know we're behind schedule a little bit. Firstly, just let you know about the UNCRC, basically how it works with that committee. It's made up from international people, people from all over the world. I think there's 12 on the committee and as a chairman. They receive input from the UN themselves, from NGOs in Ireland, from our office, the Ombudsman for Children's Office, from the state party and from children themselves who managed to, to a number of children out to Geneva to speak to the committee. And then the outcomes are concluding comments that they come out in probably February of next year. So it's a, it's a very, very important and rigid piece of work that has to be done by all, all parties concerned. Unfortunately, it is running behind schedule. This was supposed to be done in 2011, so we're covering a 10 year span. In regards to the investments in the value of the child, my office encouraged the UNCRC to, to challenge the government about expanding the framework for child impact assessments. So this is more on the budgetary financial side. We need, the state needs to be able to determine fully the level of budget being spent and its impact on children and also pre and post assessments of budget. So very simply, any one of us who's working on the project for the HSE, for TUSLA, for the Department of Education is very quickly asked, how much do you need? What are you going to spend it on? And when are you going to come back and tell me how well it worked? The government doesn't work in the same way. They need to start creating a, a, a child impact assessment so that they know where the money goes. Department of Children and Family or Youth Affairs is very clear now, they have 1.2 billion. We can check that where that money's going. But the money that goes to health that relates to children, the money that goes to justice that relates to children, the money that goes to uh, social, uh, social welfare, social um, protection departments isn't clearly marked. So we can't follow the trail of where the money's been spent on children and whether there's been an impact on that. And that's something that's, that's part of uh, 
the UN Convention of the Charities that it should be done. So their response is that they've come back to the government and they said that they're going to, they want specific information on the measures taken to mitigate the negative impact of austerity measures on the implementation of the Convention, including for children and migrant and ethnic minorities. So they very much hear what we're saying here and they want us to, they want the government to give them the information they need. Now, already I've been speaking too long, so I'm going to leave you, give you over to a family who have been hit by the impact of, of austerity. This is a family, Rose is the mother whose who's, both parents were addicts and they died very young, left her and her siblings in a tough state. All her siblings and herself were addicts. She now has two young children, she's been clean for four years and she's trying to, struggling to get a house for herself. She found herself in an emergency accommodation, very, very poor emergency accommodation and came to us looking for help. What I want to do here now, if the technology works, let's go back to this, and try and give you the voice of, of um, Rose speaking here. Way of helping families with kids. They should be looked after. It should be, I don't know, more of a caring thing, not a paperwork thing. They should look at it from the point of view of the kids, a way of fast tracking families, have a care plan and good information, explain what's happening and what's going to happen. Clarity, that's the word. The emotional side is a nightmare and that's not taken on board. I'm on depression tablets. I remember telling the children when we were moving here and when we moved in, Tracy said, Mommy, are we still homeless? She knew this isn't a home. I don't have my own bedroom. We have bunk beds. I have my teddies. It's freezing. Sometimes in the mornings we get our blankets and pillows and move into mommy's bed. But we're never late for school. This isn't a normal house because we're not allowed to bring friends here. We're not allowed outside when other people are out there. I've never had a sleepover with friends since we came here. I imagine our home would have carpet up the stairs. When I close my eyes, our kitchen is a normal size. It has a glass fridge. The sitting room has a three-seater couch. There's a fire in each room and it's cosy. Upstairs are like three bedrooms and two bathrooms. All the rooms have closets and heating. I imagine a front garden with a dog. At the back there's a porch with chairs and a table. It's all glass and sunny. There's a back garden too with a trampoline. Oh, and an apple tree. There's a seven-year-old kid now. It's freezing here. That's why I have this furry blanket. I share with my mom and my sister. I don't like when people break me. We've no upstairs. I've no space to play except in the room. And that's full of clothes. I'm sad because I don't have a dog here. The apartment that we were in for was stinky and smelly. The people upstairs used to fight. One day we battered the pregnant girl outside our front door. We couldn't get past. When I think of the house I like, in the sitting room, there's a doggy drink of water. The teddy is on. Upstairs, there's a black and white stripy room in my room. I have two beds so my friend can sleep over. I have pictures on the walls, because I can't have any in this house. In the garden, there's a flower pot there, and there's a flower pot there. We have two hair dogs, a trampoline, and a bouncy castle. If we had that house, we wouldn't have to move all the time. We're required over that. So, very clear indication of where the children's rights weren't being upheld and where they were talking about the simple places, the small places where they live, that's where the rights need to be. Um, you're not looking at a huge financial outline in a situation like that. Even what Rose said for the system that she's talking about, the system of allocation housing and emergency housing needs to have clarity, there needs to be a plan in place and they need to listen to the children. I can't say it better than that, but that's, that's where we're at, that's the sort of move that we have to make. Thankfully that family is, is happily ensconced in the, in the new setting or, or feel that it's really made a difference to them. Violence against children was another uh, element that we made a, a contribution to the UNCRC on and we highlighted the need for resources within the, ch within the Child and Family Agency to, to support them with the new Child and Force Bill coming in and also to improve the timely assessment of child protection referrals and establishment of nationwide 24 hour social work service. The issues that they came back with, so again, these are issues that the UNCRC have now highlighted to the government that they're going to ask them in January 
based on our, our feedback. They want to know the measures of how, what they're doing to address child protection cases. They want to know the number of trained, increased number of trained social workers, the, better, the increase in human, technical and financial capacity of social work teams for addressing backlogs. So they're very much aware of what the issues are. And then in relation to disability, basic health and welfare, again, I only picked one highlight one, so we, we wanted to make sure that the CAMs are significantly improved to meet the needs of young people. So again, we didn't highlight what they actually need, but they needed to be looked at. And the issue has been put on the, on the agenda for the government. When we said we're going to provide detailed information and measures around the timely access to mental health service. And they're also going to go a bit further and say, what are you doing to prevent mental health issues growing and getting worse and the early detection measures? So it's a crucial part from our point of view. This is our input putting pressure on the government so that they have to answer those difficult questions. And just in line with that, again, there will be one more voice of the child. This is a uh, catch, what I'll do is I'll skip to the moment. This is Koch, is, is a 16-year-old girl who's attempted suicide on three or four occasions, found it difficult to get into a residential centre, a residential setting, despite being in a &A a couple of times. And she eventually was put into an adult psychiatric ward. Um, and this is just a little bit about how she felt around it. Small difference makes me happy. I had a terrible experience, and other teenagers shouldn't have to go through it. The facilities and lack of staff is kind of a disgrace. People are caring. Lots of them are good at their job, but there's just not enough of them and not enough spaces for children and no out-of-hours response if it's needed. There should be specific wards for my age. The adult unit can't cope with children. That's not fair to us, but it's not fair to the staff either. I know a lot now about mental health, about the system and its faults. I know myself better now. I have a lot to say for myself in the world and about the world. I just wish the right people had listened at the right time. So again, hugely important commentary from the children themselves, speaking up about what the issues are. You know, very simply, I just wish the right people had listened to me at the right time. If we keep our ears open and we as professionals need to do that, it's crucial that we do and we can make a difference on their lives. The, all these are, are part of the testimonials that we have in this uh, pack called The Word from the Wise. If anybody wants to go on our website, they're all there on audio form. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to skip through a lot of the pieces I did, other pieces in relation to the UNCRC, and I'll move on to the next piece. Just the challenge to you as a college, I don't want to leave here without pushing you guys. The question I have for you then is, there, is social activism, is it a crucial part of what we need to be thinking about? Recent examples, and particularly around the engagement with many psychologists in the marriage equality referendum debate, show that there's a willingness to become involved in social issues. And this is mirrored all across the elements of society for this issue. Whether you agree or disagree with the position taken by many psychologists in favour of one side or another, there's absolutely no doubt that it's difficult to be uninvolved with issues like this. Perhaps that's driven by our experiences of impact of injustice and poverty on mental health. Trinensensky wrote nearly over 20 years ago that Psychological problems do not exist on their own, nor do they come out of thin air. They're connected to people's social support, employment status, housing conditions, history of discrimination, and overall personal and political power. Therefore, promoting complete health means promoting social justice for there cannot be health in the absence of justice. And again, if we look at what's happening here, the thing that strikes me about this, this photograph, if we put ourselves 20 years ago when I started in psychology, or coming down here, where each one of those were 20 years ago. There was a drag queen trying to survive in Dublin. There was a minister who was a, so, a, no, a future minister who was only a social worker somewhere in Ballyfermot, and there was a guy who was working towards the, towards the Good Friday Agreement. There's no way those guys should have been in the same room together. But for me, it's just progress. There's, there's times change, and we always have to see to the future where we can make things different for children as much as possible. The marriage referendum debate also saw 100,000 new people registered to vote and tens of thousands of young people become involved and passionately engaged and anyone who followed the home, hashtag home to vote phenomenon could not have been but struck by the power of social activism. That was driven by the powerful idea that we can all and should, all can and should do something about the defects in the world around us. 
Yet we live in an Ireland with a history of looking the other way, of deference to the established order, and of an integrated authoritarianism that most clearly manifested itself in the scandal of institutional child abuse. As Minister Fitzgerald said, while she was Minister for Children and Youth Affairs at the time in 2011, at every turn Irish people kept their mouths shut out of deference to state, system, church and community. When they should have been unified in fury and outrage, they were instead silenced, afraid to even whisper criticism against the powerful. She went on to add, let's not fool ourselves into believing that abuse occurred in a sepia-toned Ireland that is dead and gone. Abuse, awful, shocking abuse, happened long after we knew of the atrocities of the distant past. And again, it was covered by deference. It was facilitated by the well-meaning and the weak, by the cowardly and the complicit, by the silent and supportive. And the fundamental lesson that she says, and in this I agree with her, is that we must create a society in which no one is afraid to speak, in which no one is afraid to challenge authority and power, because deference to the powerful is a guaranteed way to help that power corrupt. I think we as psychologists are around power all the time. We need to make sure that we're never deference to it. Thus, for me, that suggests that we as psychologists need to continue to support our clients, be they in the realm of health, physical or mental, education, business, forensic, adult or child psychology, wherever we encounter them. We must support them to have their voice in their own world and to help them realise their rights to the fullest possible extent. I'm going to skip through a few things here. What should we be doing? I suppose given what we bring is unique as psychologists, how well we are deploying those qualities in the defence of children and their rights is crucial. Clearly one way in which we can do that is to, is to be more alive to and act more decisively when faced with transgressions of children's rights. It is of course our professional duty, but we are guilty sometimes of looking the other, are we guilty sometimes of looking the other way? We know for certain that in the past that happened, but is it still going on? As Minister Fitzgerald said, let's not fool ourselves that deference is all now in the past. One way to address that is through the development of a rights-based culture. Because I believe that we all, we all need to be engaged upon the project to create a child-friendly system of public administration where everyone involved understands the need to protect and promote human rights. Part of this will be done by helping professionals such as yourselves to understand your role in this and build your confidence and capacity to assert that role. And one way the state can do this is to provide training in the field of children's rights and especially to promote an understanding of a rights-based approach. I have a big long spiel to go into there, but I'm not going to go into it because, again, we have time constraints. But what I will say is that, as psychologists, we have a professional and social duty to stand up for children's rights wherever possible and to listen to what children say whenever we can. We must certainly try to ensure that the next generation of psychologists understands how crucial an aspect of the work this is. But how should our education of trainee psychologists reflect this role? Should our professional ethics teaching address this issue more openly? Should we have human rights and children's rights in part of our ethical discussions? Over the last three years, my office has initiated a program of seminars for postgraduate students who have chosen careers that have the potential to impact directly on children's lives. Hundreds of students have undertaken postgraduate studies who are undertaking postgraduate studies in social work, social care, education, child protection, have participated in this programme to date. We're close to a thousand now, I think, this year. That engagement underscores for us the importance of building awareness and capacity among professionals about a children's rights approach to their professional practice. I'd like to extend those seminars to include psychology trainees so that they too can know the importance of human rights approach in their work. And I offer the invitation to any course director who is interested to feel free to contact my office about Come with this. It's only a, a half-day workshop and we'll facilitate you in any way we can. The Office of the Ombudsman and Children's Office also supports the development of rights-based approach through our own research and activities. And we example, we commissioned a report called the Child-Friendly Healthcare, in which we linked with a lot of major uh, Irish hospitals and it makes practical suggestions as to how a rights-based approach can be implemented in our health and care services. And we drew on the best practices and experiences internationally, as well as examples from within Ireland, to assist healthcare professionals in making a more rights-based approach. You, as psychologists, can provide crucial feedback, positive, where you think things are improving, or where you see examples of good practice that could be mainstream, mainstreamed elsewhere. But you could also be a voice where your opinion is that there, things are negative, where systems, procedures, or policies are broken down, or worse. The recent commentary in the US and internationally on the role of psychologists in prisoner interrogation is a real example of a profession reflecting on its overall role in society. 
Such feedback is vital to my office when reporting to the Oireachtas or to bodies such as the United Nations. When we explain the reality of Ireland's performance in relation to children's rights. We've all seen the glossy policy documents and the policy press releases, but sometimes the reality in those small places is very different. We all know information is power, and without it, it can be difficult to overcome that spin and that gloss. It helps us all to speak up when necessary so that we can keep the focus rightly on the children in the centre of our work. My office could most certainly do with your help on this, and we would welcome your feedback and comments. I'd therefore like to challenge you all to become our eyes and ears on the ground in those small places. It would be a significant contribution and support to the work we do in facilitating change. The realisation of children's rights in Ireland is an unfinished product, pro project. Failings are evident across all different areas of public administration concerning children where we have fundamentally found policy implementation dominating over children's rights and best interests. You all have a key role to play in changing that and I want to assure you that you have the support of my office in doing so. We also wish to promote amongst mental health professionals the willing to listen more closely to the experiences of young people themselves. Listening to children and young people like Koch, who we heard earlier, presents a vital opportunity for all of us to learn and improve the service we offer to them. Not least because the attitudes of some professionals towards children with mental health problems needs to be challenged and changed as they reflect the belief that such children are cognitively less able to be consulted and involved in the decisions affecting them. I'm a firm believer in the old saying, out of the mouth of mouths of babes, because it is by humbling ourselves to hear the opinions and perspectives of the children in our care that we grow a more cooperative relationship and avoid the pitfalls of assuming ourselves the expert and the child the subject. We all have a unique contribution to make in our quest to make the rights real in the small places. And I suppose what I'm doing today is to challenge you to become pathfinders. Something that is difficult and often scary, but without pathfinders, little will change. Without what Robert Kennedy once called numberless, diverse acts of courage and belief, the status quo remains. He went on to say, each time someone stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centres of energy and daring, those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. The mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. It may sound extreme, but at times children would feel it's like that. For us it may not look like that, but for them it feels like they're being oppressed or there's resistance against them if we don't hear them properly. In the past, and perhaps still today, when children report abuse or other violations of their rights, their voices carried little weight. They weren't listened to then, and they weren't believed. It's still happening now, unfortunately. We can hope that it will change, but it needs to be more than a wish or a hope. You as professionals, and as parents, uncles, aunts and citizens, are the last link in the chain that leads from Ireland signing the Convention on the Rights of the Child in 1992, through the Oireachtas and the Legislature, through public services and implementation of policies, through the HSE and the, all the various public bodies, right through to the child or the young person you come into contact with. Each one of you is the means whereby those international commitments are made real and practiced on the ground every day, in the small places close to home. So please, continue to stand up for the ideals of children's rights, improve the lives of others and speak out against injustice. Then we will know Ireland is truly keeping the best interests of children at the heart of our society. Thank you all. No, I'd just like to say thank you for that. I, I don't know about you, but I feel both challenged and inspired by that, um, and really challenged to say what we can do. It's so easy sometimes to hear things and then not follow them through, um, and nothing really happens, but certainly, um, you know, I'd like to say that as, as incoming president, I'd be really happy to work um, alongside with you to find a way that people, that psychologists in our day-to-day -day work can actually work with you uh, to make some of what you've asked for real. Niall, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just say then, putting on my other hat, <laughs> as conference uh, chair. There are um, some presentations being made in here now at three o'clock. 
So I know the people will want to chat and stuff. If you wouldn't mind moving outside so that the other people can come in, that would be great. Thank you.